some people, or some people in the past, have been exposed to cobalt in, 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 at work, in, in industry or manufacture, uh, manufacturing settings. Um, of course, keep in mind that the route of exposure, mainly inhalation, is entirely different uh, form of exposure than from the internal source, such as a, a metal prosthesis. Nevertheless, some workers who are exposed to cobalt-containing powders or uh, particles uh, during hard metal production or, or pigment production uh, develop respiratory complications such as occupational asthma or pulmonary fibrosis. Development of these respiratory ailments is, is attributable to elevated cobalt and cobalt alloy uh, dust that are found uh, in their work environment. And in some instances, uh, immune mechanisms uh, uh, results uh, in cobalt stimulation and of, of an immune response uh, and inflammatory process that are the underlying uh, mechanisms or the underlying basis of those particular ailments. Similarly, cobalt powders to which some workers are exposed uh, can produce dermal reactions or a contact dermatitis, a contact dermatitis reaction, which is a rash which again has an immunological uh, reaction as the underlying, uh, as the underlying mechanism uh, and an un immunological reaction that's taking place in the skin. So that's all well and good. And, and, and it begs the question is that what can we take away from studies regarding occupational exposure to cobalt that we can imply to inform us regarding the risk associated with exposure from metal alloy containing prostheses? And first, an understanding of how studies from occupationally exposed worker cohorts drove regulatory guidelines for workplace safety standards. These are studies that address the permissible levels of cobalt allowed in the ambient environment and the relationship between those environmental levels and biological exposure indices. Biological exposure indices is another way of saying Blood, level, blood levels as well as, as well as urinary levels. The long uh, and the short of all that is that uh, biological exposure indices for allowable levels of cobalt uh, in, in, biological, uh, in, in biological fluids, blood and urine, have been, uh, have been defined. And for cobalt, it's defined as above five parts per billion. So this has bearing on the issue of what's a normal level of cobalt. Occupational regulatory standards inform us that above five parts per billion, again, five micrograms per liter. So occupational regulatory standards inform us that above five parts per billion is not considered normal. Patients with joint replacements containing cobalt chromium metal alloy are not subject to standard biological monitoring. Hence, unacceptable patient levels have yet to, to be defined by any authoritative entity. No guidelines relating to a safe biological metal level, ion level, in joint replacement patients has been produced. With that in mind, and with consideration of what I told you about regulatory standards based on occupational exposures, perhaps that, um, that helps you to understand the difficult position that treating surgeons have been put in in evaluating metal ion levels in the context of poorly performing hip replacements. Keep in mind that a treating surgeon or a physician is evaluating a more complete set of patient-specific data, not just metal ion levels. And the treating doc also is better positioned on a case-by-case -case basis to know what the long-term health consequences and options are for an individual patient uh, with regard to the potential need for a revision. That being said, the emerging scientific consensus appears to be that systemic metal ion monitoring in blood, serum, and urine, maybe all of the above, provides some diagnostic value for, for determining the extent of implant wear.